Hello. Welcome, everyone, to the Grassman Chronicles. We are your hosts. Look at the trees. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And my name's Dave. And here at the Grassman Chronicles, we explore all kinds of other outworldly claims. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at a haunting, an alien abduction, and you will want to stay tuned to the end. Don't go anywhere because we got an extra special story from Trees tonight. He's going to share his own Bigfoot encounter with us. So stick around for that. Trees, how you doing? Good, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you. And Good thanks for you. everybody joining in the chat. I think see Pragmatic, Kata, Randy, Hi. Atheist Mo, Logan. Dank, Mike's there. Good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad everybody's right, cool. Go ahead. I said, I'm glad everybody's here. All right, let's jump right into it. And we're going to start out. We've got uh, some video clips that Trees made. So we're going to start out with that. And then he's going to comment a little bit. And then we'll talk about it. All right. I can uh, get it up there. Here we go. Local lore has it that in 1833, a young Lady Ben from, the, from a wealthy family in Wheeling, West Virginia, had been courting a younger man from Fairview in Ohio. She snuck off in the family coach with a particularly energetic horse. She headed to Fairview on what was known at the time as Zane's Trace to meet up with her lover. On the third bend from the top of the hill heading west of Morristown, Ohio, a large crash of lightning and thunder spooked the horse, causing the coach to slide. During the slide, Lady Ben's veil got tangled in the coach's wheels, pulling her out of the carriage and decapitating her. It is said that on stormy nights, you can see Lady Ben headless astride on a wild-eyed horse with steam clouds of moisture coming from, the, coming from the horse's mouth and nostrils as it bucks and kicks recklessly down Route 40. If you want to tell folks, Trees, what's going on here? Uh, yeah, this is this is what would have been Zane's trace. And right here where it slows down is it's been still where uh, the accident is supposed to have taken place. That is right there with you with that one. Go ahead, you're breaking up. Oh, sorry. No, it's, right it's because the video is playing at the same time. So just, just go ahead and what you were saying. Oh, gotcha. Like right there would be in front of that old black and white photo that you showed with the old car. Like that would be in front of that old car. And then I take a right and go down the dirt roads. So you go ahead. Doing a little road work there, Trees? Yeah. Well, like, that's how the roads are over here. Like, if there's a storm, like, they there might be whole trees and stuff laying in the road. So, there was cows and trees and all kinds of stuff in the road that day. <laughs>
All right. And then I take it you're arriving at the cemetery. Yes. This is Salem Cemetery. And this is where uh, Louisa Fox is buried. I may be mispronouncing her name. I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to say it. But yeah. Louisa, Louisa. It's got a Z in it. So yeah. it's one of those tough ones, right? Liza Fox was brutally murdered by her stalker, 22-year-old coal miner Thomas Carr, in 1869. There's a marker located on Starkey Road marking the murder site, and her grave is in nearby Salem Cemetery. 13-year-old Louisa was a housemaid for a local farming family that also employed Carr. There's conflicting reports, but it seems that Carr asked Louisa's father for permission to marry her. Louisa's parents rejected Thomas Carr's request. According to the highly publicized at the time court proceedings, Carr fought for the... U for the Union Army during the Civil War. He reportedly struggled with alcoholism, fights, and committed murders before being discharged. Late afternoon, January 21st, 1869, Thomas Carr attacked Louisa Fox, a 13-year-old that Carr supposedly loved. He stabbed her multiple times and cut her throat before leaving her in the ditch. Before Carr was caught, he attempted to take his own life twice. First with a knife, then with a gun. He was treated for his wounds and sentenced to death five days later. Thomas Carr was the first legal execution in Belmont County. His neck wasn't immediately broken. He slowly suffocated. Carr and Fox are said to haunt the area to this day. All right, gang. Louisa Fox's grave. Just a couple additional things there. Uh, I guess Thomas Carr, like as he was being brought up to the gallows or the tree that they hung him from, he was professing that God had forgiving him, forgiven him and that he would be united with Louisa again in heaven and all this, you know, all these uh, religious uh, rhetoric. And he was saying that in front of like their fam Louisa's family who would be there. And uh, also when he, um, when he murdered her, she was walking with her younger brother and the younger brother saw it like go down and he took off running to get their parents. But, you know, it's too late at that point. He was already, you know, doing bad shit to her. So that's terrible. Yeah. And we were mentioning uh, not only, yeah, he was uh, supposedly uh, committed murder during the Civil War. And then, you know, that's kind of difficult to do in a war. I mean, you know, you, yeah, he you're, you're killing people. Movie. So he must have been doing some wicked stuff, right? Right. And then you had mentioned before we started how he murdered a woman in the Wheeling Tunnel. Like, that's where I, I used to work. Uh, on several different jobs in, in Wheeling. So I'm familiar with both areas and everything in between. So like, that's kind of why I picked the story, but like he murdered someone there and that's probably 25 or 30 miles from where Louisa, where I took that footage from. So you got to figure by horseback, that would be 
I don't know. I, I have no idea how long that would take, but it'd take probably the better part of a whole day, I would imagine, to ride a horse from there to there. Now let's, uh, we got a little bit more footage here. A little show of uh, Tree's Adventure. Yeah, this is just footage of the uh, cemetery again. And and we should also mention that uh, there are supposedly witches that haunt this cemetery too. Yes, well, suppose that there's tales of like occult happenings out there that like you would see pe hooded people with torches walking along the hillsides and stuff. And there's there's a lot of strip pits from strip mining out there. So there's large high walls and big rock cliffs and different things like that. You really can't see it in the summertime, but like in the fall when the leaves are off, you can see all the rock cliffs and stuff. Well, and just being there, is it, is it spooky? Does it feel spooky? You know, is it a, honestly, it, I'm, I'm a leery vibes or anything, you know? I'm leery of the area, but I'm leery of the area because of people. Like, like I said, like as a adolescent, like I got arrested in Egypt Valley, like for drinking, like in that cemetery right there. Like I got hauled off to county jail and like did a little bit of time. I, I think I just stayed overnight. Like I, it, it wasn't anything major, but you know, it was just public in talks and something stupid, but like, that was always the area where the high school kids would go to to mess around and hopefully not be bothered by anybody. But also that would bring a crowd of, you know, less innocent people, you know, the criminal variety that were up to no good and would possibly hurt you or rob you or do something like that out there. So I'm always more leery of, uh, the actual the human. living yeah <laughs> the the dead haven't bothered you so far is is that yeah. your testimony yeah they right, seem well, let's, to be one. <laughs> let's let's enjoy the scenery a little bit more here and then we'll uh we'll chit chat Okay. So you can see like it there's a lot of vandalism that happens there. Like a year ago that fence wasn't even there. They had just put that up and those signs that said to stay out or whatever. But like a year ago uh you seen Louisa's marker was laying on its side. So somebody had done that within a year. That uh Salem Cemetery signs laying on its side. Like it, that stuff was standing not that long ago, you know, within five to 10 years, that stuff was all standing upright. So they have yeah. problems. Uh, I, I can understand having a spot to go to party or whatever, but stuff like this is unnecessary. It's just right. It's completely unnecessary. I don't understand. Like old stuff to me is cool. Like when I see something with 1800s etched in the side of it, I think, wow, that's, pretty fucking cool you know like i don't think oh i want to knock that over and fuck it up you know but like not to say i wouldn't have done something stupid like that as a teenager or some shit but like well i honestly i didn't because like i was up there getting drunk and we that we didn't do that we just sat there and got drunk and hoped nobody came up there <laughs> like there was there was an old cemetery by the high school that i went to and of course halloween we would gather and let's go stroll through the cemetery. But, you know, yeah, we didn't, you know, knock stuff over or anything. I mean, that just, you know, that's that's a line. We just, you know, it's unnecessary. Yeah. It's just unnecessary. Well, if you would take, if like that Salem Cemetery sign that was laying down, if you would do a 180 and turn around and look behind as you're facing that, if you would look the other way, there's a high wall back there that's hidden by some trees and stuff. And there's like some four wheeler trails. 
when I was in high school, somebody was out there drinking and thought they could take their truck back there. And they drove it off that high wall and dropped Oops. 60 foot. They didn't die, luckily, but they were hurt pretty bad. And I don't know, but their truck is probably still in that high wall because I don't know how they would even get it out. Right. And I, this is the picture you were talking about. So that, that at the beginning when you were driving through, you went right by this area then, right? Yeah, right when my video slowed down and you seen like the sign for the interstate, that was that where that car's sitting. And you can even see how the tra the that it'd be a trail there, but it winds back up the hill there the way I came down. But I would be coming from behind that car, how it sits. And then yeah, the this the Salem Cemetery and yeah, this uh uh, there's stories you can go to the uh, Belmont County um, informa Tourism Information Center if you want more information on things like this and uh, other there's hauntings been, and things they have. Yeah, there's been books written about it, like Haunted Ohio, I believe it's called. It's kind of a popular book, and it has mentions of it in there, both stories. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting local legend as far as the lady ben hill goes there's a lot of supernatural spookiness to it but this is more legit it actually happened that dude was executed for his crimes and then there's the lore of the hauntings afterwards after the the horrible event or whatever and there's a marker that commemorates the uh, on the spot where she was murdered yeah. And here, here's the uh, newspaper article. If anybody's interested in reading it, yeah, just pop up the, uh, what's his name? What, uh, Thomas, Thomas Carr. Yeah. Thomas Carr. And, uh, yeah, there's a whole write up on the, on the, uh, killing. And, yeah, he talked a lot about a lot of things. So, if you want to read about all the stuff he had to say, he had a lot to say, as, as Trees alluded to earlier. Yeah, he and he was admitting to other killings and doing like so. He's suspected to be a serial killer at that point, and then like that's why I call him her stalker because I mean, come on, she was thirteen. I don't give a fuck if it was eighteen sixty, nineteen sixty, twenty sixty, like. That dude shouldn't have been fucking with a 13-year-old, and I'm not going to refer to him as her suitor or her boyfriend or some shit like that. I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. It's just a bad, bad dude and wrong place, wrong time type situation when you just got... I'd say he was stalking her. I'd say he had it. Because, I mean, he thought he could ask the parents and he may get his way that way. And well, they and he turned was, he down. Was, he may he was, have been emboldened because he had he already had what it seems like a record of killing people and getting away with it. So, And he thought he was talking to God. He, he may have thought, who know, he may have been hearing voices. He may be, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, he, he could have had serious mental problems on top of everything else. Because, again... You got to do some messed up stuff in a war to get kicked out of the war for killing people. I mean, right. Right. that's messed up. And I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying that's messed up. And like, like he showed, somebody uh, knocked it over. Uh, we, let's hope to, the wind blew it over. Let's not... Right. Let's not make accusations. Perhaps the wind blew it over, but yeah, hopefully maybe, they... Uh, maybe Grass Man was scratching his back on it, and it was just an accident. So, what do we think about uh, this haunting? Um, um, do tragic events make ghosts? Is, is that just the, uh, you know... Like or, the lagoon um, has always puzzled me. Is there does does it leave an imprint in time when something just so terrible happens? You know that it's like a a, a, 
stuck in a loop, you know, just, just running in a little time loop of time that just can't progress past that point in that, in that area, in that spot. It would seem or, though, wouldn't it be full of human spirits though at that point? Because over the millions of years, there'd be so many people that have died in that spot, you know, like there would be at least a handful roaming around there. You would think, you know, like there'd be a caveman ghosts and, you know, homo habilis ghosts and all kinds of ghosts. And that leads to the next question I had was, why would they haunt such a place? I mean, why why would you want to hang around, you know, where something so terrible happened? If you're a disembodied spirit, you know, why don't you go to Disneyland or... Again, you know, I'm not trying to make light of anybody's death here, but, you know, on a lighter note, uh, if you're a ghost, why hang around this old, uh, you know, spooky hill area? When you could go to, you know, to Disneyland or. You hear the lore of like they get locked, like basically locked into an area that they got killed at or whatever. And like you said, it's like they're in a loop. Like they just, they kind of roam around there aimlessly. And then some dude will show up with his little light up meters and sit them down and they'll light up and it's then that's kind of up to interpretation of what those, what the lights mean. And did a, you know, did a bug fly by it or did a spirit walk by it? Or, you know, like, I don't know. Like I saw a whole lot of stuff like that footage from, uh, lady Ben Hill and Louisa's grave and areas like that. So there's definitely plenty of footage on YouTube of the area and different, people checking things out well that's that's what i was asking you earlier what kind of vibe you get is is that area just spooky and just good for having a lot of ghost stories because it seems to have a lot of them in that area it it is and it's creepy to me because like i know what i know like the real shit that happened there and like i remember back during like like the tail end of the satanic panic uh, era, there were actual like shithead kids that went down there and killed animals and would like string them around in the trees and, you know, freak people out. And they, there was actually a group of fucking morons that got uh, some sort of blood illness because they drank some animal's blood in their sacrifice or whatever. So they had to be hospitalized because they got fucking worms or whatever the fuck from <laughs> drinking blood. I think it was something worse than getting worms, but like I can't remember. What it, I can't remember what it was, but they got sick from doing the sick, fuck yeah. they were doing. And so that added to the lore of the devil worshippers and the satanic panic and all that also fed into a lot of the stories that you hear. Now, what about the murderer? Are are there any stories of the murderer having a ghost? Yes. Uh, there's stories that... But I guess he's more uh, ornery or mischievous, I guess. Like, he will shove you, I've heard. Like, that's what you'll hear in the video encounters that they say that it was Thomas Carr and he'll shove you or pinch you or pull your hair or, you know, something like that. And uh, what do you think? Uh, do you believe in ghost trees? Do you think there's I, something going on, or is it just imaginations in a spooky area? I personally do not believe in ghosts myself. I I think the Lady Ben story is more supernatural than actual, but I think the opposite of the Louisa story where I think it's more actual than supernatural. Like, you know what I mean? Like the tale of the supernatural is just an afterthought of what really happened. So you kind of got the opposite or not really opposite, but different types of variables there in those stories that one, somebody was having a positive trip. Uh, Lady Ben was on her way to go meet her lover and they were going to go have a good time. But 
Louisa was having the opposite of that fucking time, you know, but both leave a ghost, both leave, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like conflicting as to why the spirit would stay in that spot. And uh, speaking of the spot too, uh, what do you think? Are there just places that are just unlucky and dangerous to live in? Is it again a matter of I think dumb, about those dumb luck? The horse ha had a ghost of its own too. Hmm. The horse didn't even die, I don't think. So why, you know, could there just be uh, an imaginary ghost horse? I don't know. <laughs> oh, again, maybe it's just all one big coincidence. It could be, or people might just be creeping each other out for the last. 50 years or so down there. And uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Ty for this photograph here. Uh, Ty lives in the area. And I said, I need a spooky photograph to put up while we're talking about stuff. So he shot this photo for me and I want to give him a shout out. Thanks for the spooky photo, Ty. Appreciate it. That's a good one. I was like making out all kinds of shapes and stuff in there trying to see if I could find something. He he's got his camera ready, hoping to get a squatch. So, yeah, I I'll be the first one to know if he gets one. He'll he'll send it to me. So we will have fingers crossed. Camera. Fingers crossed, Ty, and keep that camera ready. That's right. Okay, um, now we're gonna uh, move on. Unless you've got anything else left to say, there, trees. I think we did that story pretty good. All right, the next story then we're going to move into is, oh, I want to check, uh, do we say hello? Who was all in the chat? Let's check again real quick. See a lot of people. We got none, Pragmatic, YouTube, Logan. So many people joining us. Appreciate everybody being here. Glad you could make it, Pragmatic. Glad you could make it, Logan. Always good to see everybody. I think I mentioned everybody else. I noticed none showed up. I want yep. to say hey to none. Okay, I think we've got everybody covered. Glad you're all here with us. And all right. So next story is Betty and Barney Hill. Our next story put alien abductions front and center in the media and caused an outpouring of others to follow along with many books and movies on alien abductions. The UFO sighting and alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Uh, no, not that Betty and Barney. This Betty and Barney. Betty and Barney Hill were not the first person, people, or excuse me, were not the first people claiming to be abducted by aliens in the U.S., but they were surely the most publicized abduction story up to that point. The story goes that Betty and Barney Hill were driving home from a vacation at Niagara Falls when the alleged UFO sighting happened around 10.30 p.m. September 19, 1961 on U.S. Route 3, just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire. It all began when they heard a beeping sound. Betty then claimed to have observed a bright point of light in the sky that moved from below the moon and the planet Jupiter upward to the west of the moon. Betty reasoned that she was observing a falling star, only it moved upward, moved erratically, and grew bigger and brighter. Betty urged Barney to stop the car for a closer look, as well as to walk their dog, Delcy. Barney stopped at a scenic picnic area just south of Twin Mountain. Betty, looking through binoculars, observed an odd-shaped craft flashing multicolored lights traveling across the face of the moon. Because her sister had several years earlier said she had seen a flying saucer, Betty thought it might be what she was observing. Through binoculars, Barney observed what he reasoned was a commercial airliner. However, he soon changed his mind because the craft rapidly descended in his direction. This observation caused Barney to realize, quote, this object that was a plane 
was not a plane, unquote. The Hills said they continued driving on the isolated road, moving very slowly through Franconia Notch in order to observe the object as it became closer. At one point, the object passed above a restaurant and signal tower on top of Cannon Mountain. Betty testified that it was at least one and a half times the length of the granite, cl granite cliff profile, which was 40 feet, about 12 meters long, and that it seemed to be rotating. The couple watched as the silent, illuminated craft moved erratically and bounced back and forth in the night sky. Eventually, they said the object rapidly descended toward their vehicle, causing Barney to stop in the middle of the highway. The huge silent craft hovered about 80 to 100 feet, 24 to 30 meters above the hills, 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, and filled the entire field of view in the windshield. It reminded Barney of a huge pancake. And you can see the image here is what uh, Barney drew or had drawn of what he saw. Using the binoculars, Barney claimed to have seen 8 to 11 humanoid figures, and you can kind of see them in the uh, drawing there. There appears to be people looking out the windows there. Barney claimed to have seen 8 to 11 humanoid figures who were peering out of the craft's windows, seeming to look at him. Barney had a recollection of observing the humanoid forms wearing glossy black uniforms and black caps. Red lights on what appeared to be bat wing fins then began to telescope out of the sides of the craft. And you can see that in the drawing. And then a long structure descended from the bottom of the craft. Now we're going to jump forward a little bit. Ten days after the alleged UFO encounter, Betty began having a series of vivid dreams. She continued for about five or six nights and after, the, after that uh, fifth or sixth night, they stopped and never recurred, though they occupied her thoughts during the day. In November 1961, Betty began writing down the details of her dreams. In one dream, she and Barney encountered a roadblock and men who surrounded their car. She lost consciousness, but struggled to regain it. Then she realized that she was being forced by two small men to walk in a forest at night and of seeing Barney walking behind her, though when she called to him, he seemed to be in a trance or sleepwalking. The men stood about five feet to five feet four inches tall and wore matching blue uniforms with caps similar to those worn by military cadets. They appeared nearly human with black hair, dark eyes, prominent noses, and bluish lips. Their skin was a grayish color. She and Barney were taken back to the car, where the leader suggested that they wait to watch the craft's departure. They did so, and then resumed their drive home. Betty's account under hypnosis was similar to her five dreams about the UFO abduction, with some notable differences, mainly pertaining to her capture and release. Also, the technology on the craft was different. The short men differed uh, significantly in physical appearance, and the sequential order of the abduction differed. But Barney's and Betty's memories in hypnotic regression were mostly consistent with one another. Under hypnosis, Barney recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but afterward he felt irres irresistibly compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods. He eventually sighted six men standing on the dirt road. The car stalled, and three of the men approached the car. They told Barney not to fear them. Barney described the beings as generally similar to Betty's hypnotic recollection. The beings often stared into his eyes said Barney with a terrorizing, mesmerizing effect. Under hypnosis, Barney said things like, quote, oh, those eyes, they're in my brain, unquote. And, quote, I was told to close my eyes because I saw two eyes coming close to mine, and I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes, unquote. And, quote, 
All I see are these eyes. I'm not even afraid that they're not connected to a body. They're just there. They're just up close to me, pressing against my eyes, unquote. Betty and Barney were led from their car towards the alien ship. Betty walked with them, and she was told they would not be harmed. One point of confusion among the hills was if they spoke verbally or if it was telepathic. They assured Betty that they just wanted to do a few tests, while Barney seemed to be in a daze and was being carried by several of the men, where they surmised the scuffs on Barney's shoes came from later. They described them as being about 5 feet tall, about 150 centimeters in height, with a gray metallic looking skin, with disproportionate bodies, and large heads that tapered at the chin, the typical triangle shaped head. They were escorted up a ramp into the ship that was lit up with a blue fluorescent light. While on board, Barney recalls being placed on a metallic-like operating table in a mostly empty room with blue walls. Barney had his eyes shut through most of it, but he said there were about three or four individuals in the room with him, and they seemed to give him a physical, touching his back, checking his mouth, and he said his arm was scratched by something like a stick. Betty, however, recalled seeing more equipment in the room she was in. Gadgets on the walls, as she described them. She was placed on a stool, and samples of her hair, skin, fingernails, and earwax were taken. She was then disrobed, placed on a table, and was told she was getting a neurological test. A device with a lot of needles with wires leading from them were placed all over her body. And then Betty was given what they said was a pregnancy test through her navel with a five-inch long syringe. After the examinations, Betty had some conversations with the beings. Betty asked them if she could take something with her because no one would believe her and the beings told her she could take something with her. Betty said she chose a book from a shelf with many strange writings and symbols in it. However, when they were exiting the craft, the being she was talking to changed its mind and said they would not be allowed to take the book, or that they couldn't allow her to take the book with her. Barney's part of the exam was over as well, and they were reunited and told they could leave. They were escorted from the craft, and about halfway back to the car, Barney estimated, and, and excuse me, they were escorted from the craft, and about halfway back to their car. Barney estimated they were on board for about 30 minutes. The leader, as the being was called, told them they should watch them leave. Betty and Barney returned to their car, where they found their dog terrified and shaking, hiding under the car seat. They retrieved their dog, and they turned to watch the craft leave. They said it became a glowing orange ball and flew away in a matter of seconds, resembling the moon they had seen earlier. Barney drove back to the highway, and they continued driving home, and again they heard a beeping sound. Arriving home at about dawn, the Hills stated that they had some odd sensations and impulses they could not readily explain. Betty insisted their luggage be kept near the back door rather than in the main part of the house, and their watches would never work again. Barney said that the toes of his best dress shoes were scuffed, and I met, just mentioned that a few moments ago. Perplexed, the Hills said they tried to reconstruct the chronology of events as they witnessed the UFO and, drive, and drove home. But their memories were incomplete and fragmented. After sleeping for a few hours, Betty awoke and placed the shoes and clothing she had worn during the drive into her closet, observing that the dress was torn at the hem, and she noticed a pinkish powder on her dress. She hung the dress on her clothesline, and the pink powder blew away. Over the years, Five laboratories have conducted chemical and forensic analysis on the dress. The results were only organics were found and nothing unusual. What the pink powder was, no one knows. There were also shiny concentric circles on their car's trunk, about the size of a half dollar, that had not been there the previous day. Betty and Barney experimented with a compass, noting that when they moved it close to the spots, the needle would whirl rapidly but when they moved it a few inches away from the shiny spots, it would drop down. 
The Hills claim the spots disappeared a few days later. One of, the Hill, one of the Hills mysteries is missing time. The Hills lost two hours they cannot account for, as they should have been home before sunrise, but they returned home to the sunrise. There was also the beeping sound they heard before the incident began and after it was over. What it was, they weren't sure. Only that they heard it the first time the UFO was spotted, and after it left, they heard the same beeping sound. There are recordings from their hypnosis sessions, but they have been locked away. However, on one occasion, the Hills were talking about their experience at church, and it was recorded and later released. The media ran with it and sensationalized it. Surprise! The Hills wanting to counter misinformation began re uh, being, excuse me, wanting to counter misinformation being reported, gave interviews to the media. There was also a report filed with the military about their experiences and even appearing on the TV show to tell the truth. In 1966, the Hills decided to document their experience themselves in a book that would become to be called The Interrupted Journey. In 1975, a movie about the Hills' experience was released called The UFO Incident, starring Estelle Parsons as Betty Hill and James Earl Jones played Barney. Sadly, Barney passed away on February 25th, 1969 of a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 46. Betty would go on to live to be 85, passing away on October 17, 2004. She spent her life as a UFO enthusiast. If it was before the incident or only after, Betty was surely obsessed with UFOs for most of her life. Now, after the incident, a few people spoke on what they thought of the claims by the Hills. Jim McDonald, a resident of the area in which the Hills claim to have been abducted, has produced a detailed analysis of their journey, which concludes that the episode was provoked by their misperceiving an aircraft warning beacon on Cannon Mountain as a UFO. And I meant, and we mentioned earlier, they did see it on that mountain. McDonald notes that from the road the hills took, the beacon appears and disappears at exactly the same time the hills describe the UFO as appearing and disappearing. The remainder of the experience is ascribed to stress, sleep deprivation, false memories being recovered under hypnosis, and after reading McDonald's recreation, UFO expert Robert Schaefer writes that the Hills are the, quote, poster children, unquote, for not driving when sleep deprived. Schaefer later wrote that as late as 1977, Betty would go on UFO vigils at least three times a week. One evening, she was joined by UFO enthusiast John Oswald. When asked about Betty's continuing UFO observations, Oswald stated, She is not really seeing UFOs, but she is calling them that. On the night they went out together, Mrs. Hill was unable to distinguish between a landed UFO and a streetlight. In a later interview, Schaefer recounts that Betty Hill wrote, quote, UFOs are a new science and our science cannot explain them, unquote. In his 1990 article, Entirely Unpredisposed, Martin Kottenmeier suggested that Barney's memories revealed under hypnosis might have been influenced by an episode of the science fiction television show The Outer Limits, titled The Bolero Shield, if anybody wants to watch it, it's free to watch on YouTube. I watched it. So if you want to go watch it, you can go watch it. It was broadcast about two weeks before Barney's first hypnotic session. The episode featured an extraterrestrial with large eyes who says, quote, in all the universe, in all the unities, beyond the universes, 
all who have eyes have eyes that speak, unquote. The report from the regression featured a scenario that was in some respects similar to the television show. And here's a sign that actually commemorates where the incident happened. So if you're in the area and you see the sign, watch the skies, okay? So, what actually happened to Betty and Barney Hill? What do you think, Trees? Um, I noticed one thing I always check for whenever somebody says anything about um, UFOs or flying objects of any kind. I look to see what kind of military bases are nearby. And there is Peace Air Force Base that was functional back at that point in time and i would guess that it's an amalgamation of false memories the hypnotic or uh not hypnotic the liquor but hip hypnosis um oh and uh, just to point out the the hills had no record of drug or alcohol use they smoked and drank coffee like everybody else did at the time and as far as anybody knows they were clean and sober so yeah i was just making sure my notes i i took notes uh peace air force base p-e-a-s-e -E, and it's in portsmouth new hampshire and it's right there right by the sighting all that shit so i think maybe they saw an experimental aircraft from the air force base because i believe they were that was the type of air force base that was like they did uh uh, like defense work and shit like that and made experimental aircraft there. And I think that plus false memories, plus maybe Barney wasn't wanting to go against what his wife was saying, you know, publicly, or, you know, he just went along to, to go along to not make waves because it seemed like, like toward the end, you were saying she was seeing UFOs everywhere. Streetlights were UFO, like everything was a UFO. So I think maybe he saw her perhaps even descending into dementia a little bit and just, you know, loved his wife and didn't, didn't want to, you know, fuck with her. It, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I was uh, kind of kidding around that he probably just said, yes, dear. Yeah. I think there was... Yeah, yes, dear. I'm just tired of hearing about it. Yes, dear. <laughs> because Barney seemed like he was a, a good guy. Uh, he, he worked in uh, uh, civil, for civil rights and everything. Uh, you know, he, he, he was a mailman. He was a vet. Uh, you know, he, he just seemed like a nice, you know, a nice guy. Probably was a nice mailman type guy, you know. And... Yeah, maybe he was a little bit too nice and a little impressionable. Right. But you mentioned the military base and some kind of an aircraft. And one of the questions I had was, and both of them uh, had their own versions of, uh, men in the road and wearing what could be described like military uniforms, all matching uniforms, and they're in the woods, and they had the road blocked off. Yeah. And if something top secret maybe crashed or had a malfunction, it wouldn't be reported by the press or anything. No. And um, that... it could yeah. have been a big blur of the bright lights, and they were sleep-deprived. And, you know, yeah, maybe they you know, escorted them out of the area and maybe debriefed them. Yeah. And in the sixties, uh, there was, what was it called where they did the LSD experiments? Like maybe they dosed them. <laughs> maybe they, you know, dosed them, shine bright lights in their face and sent them down the road, you know, and like, this is what happened. What you saw did not happen. This is what happened. And, you know, I'm, completely talking out of my ass right now like i don't you know I was, i'm talking about uh 
I forget the uh, conspiracy theory of it. Uh, I forget they they midnight climax or whatever it was where they were giving people LSD. Yeah, Get the government experiments and everything. Well, as you were saying, on a serious note, as you were saying, like if if they had a malfunction with a an, an aircraft of any sort, it could have been just an experimental helicopter or, you know, it didn't have to be something wild like they were describing. If they sat that aircraft down, they would set up a perimeter around it and secure the area and not let just vagrants wander through the area in case anything fell off and, of the aircraft. And along came Betty and Barney Hill on a dark country road and they ran into something that into it was just Bad timing again. Yeah. And as it was mentioned, right where they saw the UFO, and like you said with the uh, military base, there is a beacon on that hill to warn aircraft that it is a hill sticking up. I don't know how big of a hill or mountain it is in the area, but it was sufficient to put a light on it. And she was already, or she started identifying lights as UFOs later in life. So who knows if she was doing that at that point in time? Maybe, maybe every light she saw in the up in the sky was a, a UFO. You know, like I don't know. And there's also the restaurant they were at had a uh, was all lit up. There was something else up on the hill that wasn't open, but it had vending machines. So things were blinking in this oh, yeah. business. And oh. along the way, speaking of the big orange ball, uh, they said it looked like the moon. It looked like the beacon on the mountain. And there was a, I believe it was a hotel in the area called the Jack O'Lantern Lodge. And guess what the Jack O'Lantern Lodge had up on its side? A big round orange thing. <laughs> A big round orange ball. So they were driving sleep deprived on a, and this is back. I don't know how dark it is now, but a lot of people don't realize uh, back in the day, they didn't have street lights on a lot of these, you know, oh. highways and everything. You're driving just by headlights. So a lot of the time they were driving in pitch black and not and LED. Only, right. Not and, it, and the only things that stood out were the few lights in the middle of nowhere. And there seemed to have been a repeating pattern of seeing a big orange, a big orange, a big orange. And that all added up to when the spaceship left, it was a big orange ball. So some right. of these things are explainable. The, the, what is not explainable is the missing time. Yeah. For two for two hours, they don't know what happened. So did they fall asleep? Or did the military perhaps do something? Detain maybe, them? Maybe a little ether or something. Maybe, you know, not nothing long term, but maybe just to a tranquilizer or some conf kind. Confuse them so they wouldn't actually remember the details. Or if if Barney was like freaking out or something, maybe they gave him some kind of sedative. Just uh you know, just something to chill, he, chill out he a was, little bit. He was down and out. I mean, they, they, according to the uh, story, they were almost carrying him, dragging him because the tops of his shoes were scuffed. So that if means they, he was dragging feet behind. If they actually stumbled into a top secret military exercise, they very well might have, like, gave him a sedative. You know, that that's kind of legal to do if somebody's acting up today, like in a courtroom or something, you can give them some, you know, whatever. So perhaps they got, you know, they were both freaking out and understandably and then got tranquilized a little bit. That's the, you know, when, when I'm reading it, I, that's what I saw is that they drove into something where the road was blocked off. There was a lot of bright lights. There were men in matching you and they, and they repeatedly said men, they didn't, they weren't saying like, they said black hair. 
They said yeah. black hand first. Yeah, and they said that's one of the only conflicting things is at first I think they said nose, ears, and, and all that. Then later they said, no, it didn't have the nose and the ears. So though, yeah, some of those little things did change, yeah. But the classic uh, triangle head, big eyes, little mouth, uh, this is really where it all came from. Because well, after the, this, everybody yeah. started seeing the same thing. From her sister. You mentioned that. Her sister said, oh, you saw a UFO. Or you saw a flying saucer. And then she immediately locked on to, I saw a flying saucer. And then she started gathering information and data to support that, like street lights and different lights in the sky. And Betty, uh, I didn't. I didn't mention it, I don't think, but uh, later in life, yeah, Betty was actually jeered off stage at a UFO convention. So again, wow. not to pick on any UFO people, but they're pretty tolerant, I would say, of other believers. So the yeah. stuff she was presenting was literally like pictures of streetlights, and they just said, oh, come on, you know? Right. But the question is, is it because of the experience or was she already predisposed before? And did they watch that episode of The Outer Limits? Maybe it was running while they were, uh, you know, sometime you leave the TV on and fall asleep. I wouldn't doubt it. And like that was even early in the advent of television. You know, like that could be because we could do some shit like that today and be like, oh, I left the TV on. And obviously I had a dream about whatever the hell I was watching. But plus TV shows back then were like they were only played once and you might not see it again for months or years or so that TV show, they might not even seen it consciously. Mm -hmm. Because. It was very striking that Barney was terrified about the eyes, the eyes, the eyes. And they were and I, in his eyes, and they were inside of him. And and if you watch the the episode, yeah, the, the woman kind of gets it all in her head, and, and she's all what, getting kind of crazy. But, uh, you know, so it, it's... It that's is very similar. LSD was the the just the language he was using that it was eyes inside of his eyes and they were inside of him and like this crazy language that he was using like that sounds like somebody tripping balls like that sounds like somebody that ate too many mushrooms and they need somebody to put their arm around them and put a blanket around them and coach them back or, to them, or it just be good old sleep deprivation because. You can hallucinate and have all kind of similar experiences to drugs from doing extreme things yeah. like not eating, not sleeping, not hydrating, etc. Yeah. Low blood sugar, Sweating, blood, low sleep blood sugar, dehydration. Like so, yeah. I I'm gonna lean with they drove into something, they were sleep deprived and possibly yeah. Maybe they were, uh, they ran into something top secret. <laughs> and yeah, the rest just like filled yeah. in. And if they did get, you know, a little whiff of something for just to make them a little loopy for the, you know, just so that nobody will ever believe them, they're going to babble about anything they saw. You're right. Because, like you said, maybe just something that, you know, doses you just for a few minutes, right? Yeah. And just, and just makes everything so messed up. That the all the memories piece together, the orange ball, the orange ball, the orange ball, these different things are bouncing around in that mind, and then you've got the perfect story that comes together. Yeah, and you said they were straight, pretty straight laced people. They'd never they experienced were, drugs. They were straight laced. Like and if and they, they did get a little dose, they wouldn't know what reality was. Far far as we know, they were just a, a very nice uh, uh they were both married before, so they were both divorced and they were remarried. So, you know, a lot of times folks like that are, you know, happy to find somebody again, you know, and do their little thing and, and it seems like that's what they were doing. 
mm-hmm. they also didn't didn't set out to uh, make money off of it or anything. They didn't have any, you know, any motives or anything to make something up other than they just couldn't <coughs> explain what was going on in their head or why she was having those crazy dreams either. Right. And if anybody has any, uh, uh, you know, ideas in the chat or whatever, you think what happened with them? Uh, as far as some of the other claims go, I mean, you know, there was pink powder on the dress, but nobody, it's gone now. Nobody can identify it. And I looked all around for pink things in biologics, and there, there, there's just not a whole lot that would put a bunch of powder on a dress. There is a pink waterfall in Canada, but they were nowhere near that. Well, I was, so what, my mind went to drugs again. Like maybe, maybe that's what they got dosed with, <laughs> you know, like a face dude, full or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like a powder that they could just blow in somebody's face. That, like, yeah, that's possible, I suppose. But, and, uh, the spots on the back of their car that they said were there disappeared. They didn't have photographs of it or anything. Um, and then you have the big problem with his hypnosis because we've learned since it was very popular back in the day, but since we've learned that you can suggest just about anything to somebody and they'll sit there and nod and say, yep, 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 yep. So it's not a good reliable source, I don't think, using hypnosis. And right. dreams are dreams, Betty. I'm sorry, dear, but people have crazy dreams. And I think that's all my questions. Again, I think that they ran into an emergency situation and, or maybe there was, you know, something in the air. Maybe they got a whiff of something. I didn't even think of that. A chemical spill or something. Yeah. Chem- combining if there was a, a wreck or something like that. Cause that's happened before. Maybe maybe they got a whiff of something and Barney got a bigger whiff and that's why he was kind of out. They took him to a place. They gave him some oxygen. A little bit later, they're feeling better and they let him go. That that kind of fills in a couple hours. So yeah, all right, interesting. Anyway, uh, it's it's a it's a good uh, '70s type movie. I watched the movie. A uh, lot of stars are in it. Uh, you'll yeah. recognize a lot of faces. Um, so. Yeah, you can go and watch it. It's free to watch on YouTube. So if you want to watch the Betty and Barney Hill story with uh, James Earl Jones and everything, uh, it was it was a good little movie, you know. And you can also see, catch uh, episodes of The Outer Limits on YouTube, too. So if you want to watch some of those old 60s, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like Twilight Zone type stuff, you know. You can go watch those, too. All right. So, as promised, our third story of the night, our own Trees, is going to share with us his Bigfoot encounter. So, Trees, why don't you take it away, my brother? All right. Um, Yeah, it was back around 2007. I can't really remember. I can't put an exact date on it, but I was thinking in 2007 you know, give or take a year was probably about when it was. And me and my three friends were going to go target shooting. And my buddy, his, his father had, um, a gaming, uh, business where he would, he had pool tables and he had like extra pool balls and bowling pins and stuff that would get messed up. So we took some of the messed up pool balls and bowling pins and we were going to go shoot them with our guns. So we go out to this private land and we get the bowling pins set up and the pool balls all set up and we get, we back up and I remember I was in the middle and my friend Josh and Tom were on two sides of me and we put our earplugs in and put our (laughs) eye protection on and we start shooting the pool balls and stuff. Safety first, safety first kids. Safety that's right. first. And, Don't lose uh, an eye. That's right. And uh, so we shoot a little bit, and I think we... I, I don't think we even ran out of bullets. I think we spooked what whatever happened there. I'll get to it. 
So we shoot a few rounds, and then I hear a crash in the brush, like, off to my right, which Tommy was to my right. I believe it was Tommy. One of the two of my friends was to my right. So, like, I hear a crash, and I see, like, out of the corner of my eye, saplings, like, small trees, like, bending over. So I remember I dipped my muzzle down and went around Tommy and got over towards whatever it was. And then I figured I'd take that side and then, cause that's the way it was going. And then Tommy and Josh could deal with the left side. If it went back that way, I was just going back to like more military instinctive shit at that point. So I went around that way and then I saw it, it like stood up on its on two legs, ran to a tree, climbed the tree very quickly, and then spun around the tree and like peeked around at us, like with the tree between it and us. Like it climbed the tree, spun around it, and then poked its head out around the tree to look at us. And we, at this point, all three of us have our weapons trained on that tree. And I remember, I'm pretty sure it was Josh said, I don't want to shoot it. <laughs> and I said, I don't want to shoot it either. And Tommy's like, well, I'm not shooting it either. So we kind of <laughs> held our guns there because we did. We still weren't sure what the fuck we were seeing. Like, it scared the fuck out of us. Like, we were shaking and didn't know what we saw. So we kind of just started backing because our truck was like, you had to cross creeks to get back to where we were. And we were shooting in a creek back there. So we just back up facing the thing and it came down out of the tree and then ran back further away from us luckily so we kind of then just turned tail and ran back to the truck and got in like unloaded our shit and was like what the fuck you know of course we went through the you know the what did we just see started rolling a joint we were i mean shaking shaking like we saw something and it was big and black brown hairy big and it ran on two legs. It climbed up a fucking tree. And so we go, we, we leave the area. We left the bowling pins, the pool balls, everything we had meticulously brought down there to shoot at and shoot with. We probably left. I bet those pool balls and shit are still down there, to be honest with you, <laughs> like where we were at. And uh, we fucking took off. And probably three weeks or a month later, that place where we were down in shooting is a there's a ravine that runs down all the way up to the to the state route and the or i think it's a county road that runs down that way well news channel seven and channel nine filmed a black bear sunning itself on this farmer's hay bales that was directly across the road from that ravine that was down like if you follow that ravine you will end up in that creek that we were shooting at so I put, that's what I put together to think that I saw a black bear and not a Bigfoot. But for that month or those three weeks or four weeks or however long it was, if you would ask me if I believed in Bigfoot, I would have said yes. And I would have told you that story that we saw it. And I could take you to my three friends, Tommy and Josh. They will tell you, I ain't going to say shit. I will let you talk to them. They will tell you the same shit that I told you. You know, I mean, it was an event that happened that I'm pretty sure Josh probably still thinks he saw Bigfoot. Me and Tommy have come to the conclusion we saw a black bear. Tommy's a bow hunter. And uh, Josh isn't really a hunter. And both of us were. And we were like, that's what we saw. And And then I heard more later on in life that if a black bear has a hurt foot or et cetera, or you just surprise it, like it probably stood up to look at what we were. Cause we just popped off shots. It was probably like, what the fuck was that? And then we turned around and it took off and then it was all, you know, uh, the Benny Hill music after that. I was going to say you, you guys ruined his nice quiet afternoon in the, uh, in the sun there. Oh, he's probably having something good to eat over there, doing bear things. You know, <laughs> like probably eating blackberries. Like I, I don't know, but like we simultaneously scared the shit out of each other. And like I said, we were armed. We could have killed it. Like 
I had a headshot on it. I was looking at it. And just the way how dark the fur is on a black bear's face, I think I couldn't really make out the nose, the snout, and features. I could just see its eyes. And it was trying to keep itself behind the tree as much as it could. So, that pretty sure like, what I saw. That sounds like a lot of Bigfoot sightings where it's kind of hiding behind the tree, poking out, and you're only seeing just what you want to see. Half yeah. in the shadows, half in the leaves. And, you know, just describe, I mean, the moment of, you know, is, is it the adrenaline, the fear, the, the uh, you know, somebody yelling Bigfoot, uh, you're already looking for big, what, what all, what all think, you know, came, came in crashing in that microsecond where you go, oh man, it's a Bigfoot. My first reaction was to react as if it was coming at us. So that's why, like, like I said, I, I resorted to like training and I dipped my muzzle to not, to not brush my friends with it, to not endanger my friends and shooting them, went around and tried to flank it. You know, that's what I was doing because I thought it was coming at us at first. So I was trying to get position on it to get a good shot at it. I didn't know what it was. And then I realized it was heading away from me. So that kind of calm me down and this is all half a second you know so my reaction and then whatever Tom and Josh did they basically did what I was hoping they would do they kind of got closer to each other and like I moved away from them to to give us all room so we weren't shooting at each other to give everybody a lane of fire at what that thing where it went so that worked but none of us wanted to shoot it luckily and it ended how it ended, but like, I'm the, it definitely was fight or flight. I chose fight. I want like, you know, I, I go default aggression whenever something like that happens. And so I was trying to maneuver on it, whatever it may have been. And my friends were just kind of standing, pointing their guns at the noise. And once I saw it was a, a furry thing that was running away from me. I wasn't worried that it was a human that was going to hurt me. So I kind of let my guard down a little bit and just said, it's moving away from me. It's not a threat anymore. So I can relax a little bit. And then we all kind of looked at each other like, what the fuck was that? And then, you know, by that time it was up the tree, we were pointing our guns at it and it all, you know, we started backing towards the truck. It came down out of the tree. We ran back to the truck, got in the truck, and proceeded to shake like uncontrollably for a solid fifteen minutes. Like for as long as it took us to like break up cannabis and roll it. Like we were shaking and spilling shit and fucking <laughs> lighting it and fucking trying to trying to repeat to each other what happened. Is that what you saw happen? Yes, that's what I saw happen. And like we kind of went through that process a little bit with each other and then we drove out of there. Now what what would you think if you you were just out there making noise you didn't have guns? How how do you think the uh encounter would have gone if you weren't armed? I think it would have still it by the time I noticed that it was doing anything, that it was even there, it was trying to get away from me. The crash and the bang that I, or the crash and the brush snapping that I heard was it making a beeline away from us. You know what I mean? So I think its immediate reaction is I want to get away from these people. And then our, you know, I react, we reacted how we did, but like, I don't think it was trying to be aggressive towards me or us. I think it wanted to get away. And I think just the fact that we had numbers that I think one-on-one, -on -one, I think one of us could have probably scared it off if we got aggressive towards it. But being three humans that were all six feet tall around, I think that was enough in its own to make it want to get away from us. And I, it didn't have any babies or anything. I got a fire truck going by. Hopefully, it didn't pick it up too loud. 
Uh-huh. So, uh, so then now when you hear other people giving their uh, Bigfoot encounter stories, what do you think now that you've had your own and kind of thought through it and everything? Do you, do you think other people are seeing bear or do you not know what they're seeing? I think it's a mixture between bears and honestly, I think it's elk. Like some of the calls that you hear when they, uh, I think it's the, the beginning and the end of an elk bugle because elk, if you're not familiar, they make a really high pitched squealing noise, but right before and right after they do it, they'll go and they make this huff. And a lot of that, that vocalization is what you hear them mimicking whenever they're playing their Bigfoot calls or whatever. Cause it's like, how did you get calls for this thing that nobody has ever fucking has real evidence of, you know, like, but yet they have calls for it and, you know, vocalizations and all this shit. I think the vocalizations that are legitimate that somebody has recorded, I think they are elk from what I've heard. And I heard, uh, a famous hunter, Jim Shockey. He's a famous bow hunter, and he's like a famous big game hunter. And he said that was his his guess as well. Was he said the things that he heard that sound like a primate that he don't think is a primate are beginnings and ends of elk uh, bugles, and they they will just vocalize with that that hooping noise, like that's a a part of their vocalizations. Well, and like you said in the last episode about seeing a cow's rear end, like you just mentioned, most of the time that bear or that elk or that moose or anything big and scary enough, you know, to be, you know, at least be interpreted as being six to eight feet high are going away from you and you're seeing their rear end. So you're getting a, you're getting a totally different perspective if you ask, well, was it an elk? Because you're going to think, what does an elk look like in its face? And then the antlers in it. You're not going to think about what its what rear it's, end looks like. Well, not only that, but what its butt looks like obliquely. You know, not straight on. It's it's kind of walking off at an angle. It's not just running straight away. It's got a it's got to dodge sticks and leaves and twigs and shit just like you do. So it's not going to run straight through the woods. Like it's going to move and stuff. So you're just seeing bits and you're seeing frames, you know, the equivalent of just seeing a couple frames of a shot and then somebody stopping it and saying, what was that? You know, like, well, I, I stopped and thought, I said, you know, we've been given some of these uh, Bigfoot photographers too hard of a time. Because they're not getting a clear shot of Bigfoot's face. But if they're actually trying to take a picture of an elk's rear end or a bear's rear end, you're only going to get a furry, kind of goofy, this away, that way, maybe some dingleberries, whatever going on there, right? (laughs) You're going to get what you perceive at the time as the face. Like, you're going to look at it and try to figure out what the face is, and you're going to snap that picture. So whatever it is, if it's its butt, its shoulder, it's the back of its head, you're trying to orient it and pick up that pattern because we're pattern-seeking hominids, you know, like we... And I think that's part of it too, is as you were mentioning, like the fight or flight, if, you know, if you go to flight, you get an even briefer picture of what you just saw. If you stand to, yeah, you said a mill, you get a millisecond view of a bears or a elk or a moose, you know, we'll throw moose in there because they're big. You're, you're, you're catching, yeah, millisecond glimpse of something moving pretty fast while you're scared from a distance in an environment you're not usually in may or may not well be well lit and, and it's moving a away big old you. and it's a big old badunka dunk <laughs> it's being evasive you know what i mean it's being evasive it wants to get away from you and put as much terrain in between you and it as it can whether that's trees brush briars hills, valleys, whatever it might be. It wants to put all that in between you and it whenever it's running away like that. 
So, and it's in a constant struggle to stay upright on four legs. So it might step in a hole with this leg. It might fucking, you know what I mean? So there's, it's got two more legs than we got to worry about, you know, on the ground running. So it could be at a weird angle in different ways than we can even perceive. And we're pattern seekers and we're looking for that. We're looking for that other human standing there looking at us and we don't quite see it, but we're going to put some, you know, we're going to make it and then we're going to decide Okay. Yep. That's a big thing. That's trying to get me. I'm going to, I'm going to run. Even if it's a big old badunka dunk of a bear or something, but and yeah, I, was, I, me, I heard it. Ahead. I heard it. I looked for it and didn't see it right away because it was down on all fours running. I believe, you know, it was running like a bear. And then when it stood up and I saw it, it was like, it was, to me, it just came out of nowhere. It's like it materialized, like it like came out of the forest, <laughs> like and like then it ran up the tree in a manner that I've never seen anything go up a tree. Like I've never seen anything go up a tree like that. And in my area, we've just now have black bear sightings that are on like cameras on people's ring cams and shit. But back then, there was no real sightings. People didn't have ring cams. I'll bet, I'll bet that bear was thinking. Dang, I never climbed a tree like that before either. <laughs> yeah, you was probably scared. <laughs> well, that's that. That is a good story. I'm glad nobody was injured, or in, uh, that yeah. the poor that the poor bear didn't get shot for no reason because that would be a shame, you know. Yeah, all us hillbillies out with guns are not bloodthirsty fucking wild men. We were legitimately out there to target shoot and to see how accurate we were. We were not with, out there with safety with glasses, blood. with safety glasses and everything. Good. Yeah, Good. we were not not trying to hurt nothing and we decided against it when we had a choice to. So, well, I think we're going to have to pay a little bit closer attention to the photographs and not try to see them as a front view but see them as a rear view. And mm -hmm. I think maybe more of these pictures might start make a little more sense. I think, yeah. I think you're really onto something with the rear end, uh, running away from you idea and getting a, a shot of their rear end. I, yeah. it, it seems to make a uh, sense of why these photos always look like a big furry ball. Yeah. And let's see. Is anybody uh, in here? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Did anybody say anything about trees? Uh, I know uh, a couple of people said, "Oh, I can't leave. I got to hear this." <laughs> I was. Well, I was trying. I was trying to scan it. Uh, hopefully, it's people kinda hard. Me. And if they got any questions, I can answer them. It's no big deal. Or, well. Give the give the chat one more big scroll here just to make sure and we'll see what everybody's got going on. Let's see. Lots of people saying hello. Randy says I love stories about Sasquatch sightings. Well, good, you just had one. I hope yeah. you enjoyed it. And Pragmatic and Mo and Dank and everybody all saying hello, hello, hello. Saying hello to Speed and Mike and Hi, everybody. Pilla saying hey to the fam. It's got to be early for Cata, so thanks for joining us, Cata. Up with the uh, sunrise, perhaps, over there. And... Trees, 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 trees getting a lot of love. They love you, trees. I love them. I'm glad they made it. I'm glad they're pumped about our Grassman Chronicles. Logan says my college mascot was Sammy the Banana Slug. <laughs> That's great. Slugs represent. All right.
So we got into the slug. Everybody loves dank, dank slug there, I guess. So. Oh yeah, we got, we got we got the slug conversation going on, and and none joining in. Dingo, uh, Dingo enjoyed the ride. Oh yeah. For anybody that doesn't know, that's Tree's dog, and he was in the video at the beginning. There it looked like he was having a a good time with the yeah. nose in the window and all. And. None sharing some hellos to both of us. Good to see you, none. Kalasia, thanks for joining us. Um, somebody was booted. Did somebody get booted in the chat. Was there some trouble? Did we oh, get our not. first troll? Did we get our first troll? Are we are we officially trolled now? I hope it was Otangelo. I hope he had the shroud of Sasquatch. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, love the old photo. Yeah, that was uh, that was a cool old photo, wasn't it? Luckily, somebody snapped that picture a long time ago because you just don't get a lot of those. You know, you can, you can find pictures of almost anything today, but. Something, yeah, with with the old vehicles and everything, in it, those are a lot harder to come by. And the the developing they had to do back then to get a photo, like they had to snap it and take it and submerge it in fluids and get it to come out right. And like, yeah, Logan, uh, I think we're to the cemetery part. He said disrespectful. Yeah, and. Like the people in uh, Arizona that knocked over some rocks, yeah, it's it's just uncalled for. I mean, yeah, every everybody can do shit like that. You're not doing something cool yeah. or unusual. Like not everybody, at all. everybody can do it. Like, and that's one of those things when you get a little older, you're like, man, when I was a kid, I, you know, and now I feel bad. You know, I shouldn't have done that. You know, so you're gonna regret doing it unless you're a just a total jerk, I guess. Uh, yeah, I must. Uh, I guess we missed something. Maybe. I don't know. Hopefully there wasn't any problems. But anyway, we, we might just be out of the loop of the conversation. Right. <laughs> maybe it wasn't here. Okay. Uh, maybe it wasn't here. Oh, that's That's even better. Um, dun, 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 dun. scroll through, scroll through. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. It says no problems. Okay. Look, Fisher says. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, with uh, Pragmatic's comment about being sleep deprived, they they said they were driving from four hours, but it was four hours from their last stop at the diner. They had come oh. all the way from Canada on the other side of the falls, coming all the way back through down, you know, on the East Coast side. So they were, they, yeah, it was a long haul. Uh, Brian Stevens says he lived in Salt Fork area for many years and never saw Sasquatch or, or saw him or, what's that say? Spoon? I don't know. I don't think Brian Stevens saw Sasquatch in Salt Fork. Yeah, I say, man. Mushroom trip. Again, you know, if, if they got into something, maybe, you know, a possible chemical spill or maybe, uh, I don't know, is, is there something in the woods you could you could get into trees that's your specialty a swamp gas yeah. or something i mean maybe like the only kind of swamp gas i can think of is like methane or mostly methane like that would be and like that smells like uh like flatulence so like you would it would be very obvious that that would be what would be coming out of the ground or you know what you would be smelling and other than that mushrooms like 
that's the only hallucinogenic thing that would be around that area, especially. But yeah, and uh, YouTube mentions yeah the uniforms. I say there's something about you know when you hear they all have matching uniforms, you immediately think either military or some kind of emergency crews where everybody has on the same outfits, yeah. the same vests, you know, whatever. So that's why it had me, you know, several times they mentioned all these men, that they had the roadblock, lots of lights, and it just seems like, you know, that's something happening, you know, an, an accident of Ooh. some type. You mentioned that there was a restaurant or uh, something up on the hill that had vending machines in it. Well, vending machines are big square things, kind of like windows. Like, if she could actually see in that place and see those vending machines individually, her eyes could play tricks on her and make that, you know what I mean? Turn those shapes into her spacecraft that she drew or whatever. Yeah, and fluorescent. Yeah, again, they said it was lit up like with, you know, how fluorescent's kind of blue, you know? Right. And what was big you know, just big coming around at that time. Yeah. Fluorescent forever. lighting was showing up everywhere. It made it way convenient, more convincing if convenient, she said yeah, it was convenient LEDs. UFOs had it. Yeah. If you described an LED, if she was like, they had these little itty bitty tiny things, but they were so bright, you know, like, I don't know how they were even emitting that much light. Be like, Oh fuck that. Yeah, that lady's no. talking about an LED, you know, like, but no, she was talking about, you know, uh, fluorescence. And uh, YouTube wants to know, did anyone interview the dog? Uh, yeah, I felt bad for the dog because the, the dog, whatever was going on, didn't seem to know what was going on. A poor guy was terrified hiding under the car seat. So yeah, I had, I had to put the picture of the dog in there because I, I felt bad for the dog. Poor, yeah, man. poor dog, you know, mind his own business and all this business is going on, scaring him, you know. He was probably oh, ready to just, you know, he was probably chilling and sleeping in the car too, you know, so. That had to be a buzzkill. Uh, the dress of Turin, yeah. It was tested and nothing's found, but there's something on it. <laughs> the first thought when I see spots on my car is to get out the compass. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess there was something going on because of, you know, this was the nuclear scare days, you know what I mean? And... They, they said, like, a compass is kind of like a Geiger counter. Oh. And if, you know, uh, in a pinch, if you put a compass near something and it goes all crazy, that it, I don't know if it's true. I don't know but about somebody that. told the Hills, oh, yeah, you need to test it with a compass. So she went and dug out a compass. You know, it was like one of those old wives' tales or something. Yeah, I don't think that's real. I could be wrong, but I don't think that's real. I think that's something they would have told us in the Army, like, hey. In a pinch, because we always had compasses on us. I'm sure they would tell us, like, hey, in a pinch, if you think you're in a radiated area, pull out your compass and see if it goes crazy or glows or whatever the fuck. But, yeah, like, I'd, I've never heard anything like that. I, I never heard. I didn't look it up, but, I, yeah, I'd never heard of it. So, I, yeah, I just kind of dismissed it as, you know, an old wives' tale or something. Yeah, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that simple. The hills are alive with the sound of disinformation. Yeah, it's, you know, this story, you know, it's it's got so many things, you know, that ben, uh, the Barney and Betty Hill, I, sh I should say, had so many different things coming at it, you know? It was the, the TV show to the, the sleep dream. deprivation to the, uh, the lights about in the middle of nowhere. Like Talking about dreams like they were a thing that it happened, but it just happened in my brain. And But, you know, it's like, no. Well, again, it that, was, that was another dream. thing. And, uh, you know, around that and then into the early 70s, remember, you had that big spiritual thing coming around, yeah, pyramid dude. power. Yeah. Everybody was interpreting Dream dreams. Yeah. Yep. So that was, again, uh, uh, some of these things are dated, you know. Well, shit, the police would use psychics up till fucking present day. Like I, I think using... they still do, yeah. <laughs> I know Michael Shermer said uh, there was a school district that bought the... Uh, pot sniffing uh uh dowsing rods oh god it was a a radio shack antenna on a little box yeah and yeah if, if you walk around it would find pot in students lockers and and it's ridiculous but 
a school board bought them. Holy shit. That's that's amazing. I'm glad they got ripped off. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see anybody else here. Dowsing's a whole fucking thing by itself to go into. Yeah. I've got a I've got a shorty video about the Dowsers looking for the leak in Ken Ham's pond. It's 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 hilarious. Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, experts estimate that between 10 and 50 meteorites fall every day. Yeah, there's always, you know, there's always obviously some meteor or some could have fell. Um, uh, rockets, you know, test, test firing rockets. You know, they, they, a lot of people report something funny in the sky. Then you find out it was SpaceX launching something or whatever. 61, that's like... That's Vietnam era almost. Like, that's when like, was Sput gonna be when was Sputnik? Some, they're going to be doing some weird shit around that time. You know, they're going to be experimenting with aircraft. They just figured out the Harrier jet, the vertical takeoff jets. They, they there's a lot of things that they were just figuring out at that point. So it could be a number of things. And what we got here, we got Logan saying, uh, you're right, the moisture cloud ratio was being orchestrated by the alien spacecraft in order to hide its movements. Yeah, there's always a good uh, explanation. He's referring to the orange ball of light. And... None says he's got red balls that are light. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take their word for it. Yeah, but uh, the orange light thing I think is pretty easy to explain as that's the only thing they saw in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I, I think the sleep deprivation is kind of underrated too. Like uh it's it seems like they were had a perfect cocktail going to hallucinate some shit up. And then if they, on top of that, ran into an actual government exercise or something along those lines, it, who knows? Nunn said he saw something late one night. It was a cat with a potato chip bag stuck on its head. But from a <laughs> distance, it was eerie. And also, let's see, Nunn's, uh, or uh, Colossius says, uh, Saw a black bear from a distance once while hiking. We both minded our own business, thankfully. Yeah, and just, you know, and trees will tell you if you're hiking in these areas, carry some bear spray. Isn't that right, trees? Yes, that is my advice. Pragmatics got video of black bear on his channel, her channel, their channel. I think it, are they, yeah, it's their channel. I know I'm always seeing a gang of them. Making me hungry. And uh, let's see. A nun says, saw a cougar, bear, beaver, moose, deer, badger, coyote, all in my backyard. I mean, you got a, you wow. got a wild backyard. Yeah. I know Pragmatic's got a lot of stuff in the backyard because I see the videos. If anybody... Yeah, mentioned there. If anybody doesn't know, check out Pragmatics videos. Uh, got alligator videos. They got it's gators small. and critters yeah. and fishing and all that kind of good stuff. And I guess I guess they're in the uh, bayou. I guess you call that area. Oh yeah. So and we're gonna come down and eat one of these days. Have, a, have one every one of them crawdad broiled. We're all kind of come down there. All right, I think we're uh, pretty much uh, through here, everything. Uh, Sydney, thanks for stopping by. Good to see you. Brian, good to see you. And if I missed anybody, hello, hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it doesn't look like we got a lot of arguments. I think... Uh, 
They must have agreed with our conclusions pretty much there, Trees. We're not getting a bunch of flack or anything. So uh, well, I guess we did all right with our uh, fairness. And I hope we were fair as possible and, and, you know, try to come at it from all the different angles and everything and all the possibilities. And we're not saying we're experts or anything. And if you got your own conclusions, you know, you know, I was thinking one thing and then Trees mentioned before that, yeah, it looks like a butt. And it's like, now I've got a whole different perspective on how these photographs are taken. So, right. <laughs> it, it could be that, yeah, we, we've been too hard on the photographers and it, they did actually take a picture of some. It just wasn't its face. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're trying to get that perfect picture and you've got that small window to get it. And another and another thing, if yeah, if you are going out there hiking and everything, know your area, know the critters in the area, know how to be prepared, what precautions to take. If you're in certain areas, make sure you got a snake bite kit, whatever they recommend, just right. in case, you know, because we want you to be here for the next episode, okay? I did want to say that too about any, if anybody were to hear this or see it and go to Egypt Valley, there are high wall drop-offs that you could just be walking through high weeds and fall 60 feet off of a just a sheer cliff because they mined that area for coal back in the day and they just drug giant buckets through there that scooped out chunks of land so it's a it's a dangerous area or it can be a dangerous area if you don't know what's what and where different things are at so be careful if you're in Egypt Valley or anywhere around that area. And we went a little bit long tonight, but, you know, we had some good stories. And uh, I told Trees at the beginning, well, Betty and Barney's, you know, got a lot of info. And, you know, we went, you know, we had to hear Trees' story, too, because, you know, that's just what it's all about is hearing firsthand stories. You just can't top that. So I'm glad everybody that could stick around stuck around. I'm sorry we went a little long. We're going to try and keep them a little shorter, but you know how it goes. Sometimes you're, you know, you're going at it and we just had to make sure we completed it. We didn't want it to be thorough. Okay. And uh, before we wrap it up, I want to let everybody know that next month, the last Sunday of the month falls on my birthday. So I have Scottish heritage. My grandfather was an immigrant from Scotland when he was a little boy. He used to tell the story about waving his little American flag, you know, standing on the, on the, uh, uh it, it, whatever the, the immigration. Yeah. And, uh, so I thought because it's my birthday and everything that we're going to do a Scotland episode. So I am going to cover, of course, the Loch Ness monster, because you have to cover Nessie if you're going to cover Scotland. And the other two choices are yet to be made. Yep. But they will be coming. And we will let you know what they are in the promo when I put it out about middle of the month. So hope to see you all on the next episode where we're going to take a look at what's going on in Scotland. And they have plenty of beasties. They've got plenty of haunted castles. They've got it all. And we're going to bring some to you. And... It should be a lot of fun. Trees, it's always a pleasure. Got any yep. uh, final comments? Anything going on over at your channel or anything? Uh, not really. Um, I'll have some kind of videos being put out occasionally, plus these, uh, these at the end of the month. And I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and giving us support and showing us love. And I do appreciate everybody that joined us, and I appreciate everybody that's been enjoying watching our uh, first episode. We got a lot of views. A lot of uh, people enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's kind of fun stuff. You know, this is a little bit of you can let, you know, let it go a little bit, relax, and let's just talk about some things and not be so uptight. You know, sometimes the, some of the topics we get into are a little heated and political and social and raise emotions and everything but hey anybody enjoys you know a, a nice ghost story a nice alien story and a nice bigfoot story am i right 
and you get to, you get to flex your skeptical muscles. You get to pick apart claims. You get to do the things you get to do with the the debate me bros. But you get to do it in kind of a fun environment where nobody's really it doesn't really fucking matter. You know, like you're just kind of speculating and throwing stuff at each other to see what, what other people have to think about it. And I think it's, it's a fun way to exercise your skepticism. And that's why it's great doing this with my co-host trees, because we have a different perspective. We see things different, you know, and we both make each other go, Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that one, you know? So it's always good to get another opinion. I always appreciate Trees bouncing opinions off of him and what he's got to say. Yeah. And do go check out his channel. Look at uh, look at the Trees. He's got a lot of great content. And, you know, if you need a, a little pastor blaster or you need some hiking tips or you just want to check out the beautiful scenery in some of his videos, make sure you subscribe. And... Make sure you subscribe and like here if you like the Grassman Chronicles. And we will see you next month.